Good afternoon. <clears throat> Today we're pleased to welcome seven witnesses representing the Federal Trade Commission, the consumers, industry, especially businesses with an internet presence and whose main line of business is to create and sell advertising. And I would like to thank them <coughs> for taking the time out of their busy schedules to share their perspectives on consumer privacy, as well as to outline their view as appropriate offline and online business privacy protection and personal information use practices. Have you ever been in the midst of a group of people and heard someone say, what say what's said in this room stays in this room? As someone in that room, you know just from that statement that what may be said could be juicy enough, sensitive enough, or valuable enough to tempt one of the other persons in that room to violate that compact by leaking that information to people who are not in the room during the discussion. And the very utterance of these words evidences a conscious intent by the participants to set the needed environmental conditions that would encourage those in the room to interact freely with one another and to share data share information without the fear that that very information will harm them economically, emotionally, or otherwise at some point in the future. <coughs> as an avid user of the Internet and as a person interested in technology, communication, and all things digital, I know there is no free lunch where I go on to the Internet website to read or view content, especially when I'm not paying for that content. That internet website and the advertisers who are underwriting the overhead <coughs> and operating costs of that website know that my information, whether it can be used to identify who I am or whether it gets merged in with other users' information, has substantial value and can be monetized when it is provided to others. Before the House was scheduled to adjourn for its August recess, I, for one, felt that it was imperative on Monday of this week to introduce privacy legislation in the form of H.R. 5777, the Best Practices Act. I also thought it was important that we quickly hold a hearing in this subcommittee on the assorted pros and cons of my bill, as well as the other issues outlined in the discussion draft released by Chairman Bowser and Ranking Member Stearns of the CIT subcommittee. <coughs> the Best Practices Act <coughs> speaks to a host of issues affecting consumer privacy, inclu including consumers' expectations as to how their personal information should be handled, shared, and disclosed to third parties. This legislation also addresses other important issues, including what defaults should be set in connection with those expectations to provide regulatory certainty to industry and to investors. <coughs> what safeguards should be crafted to anticipate foreseeable abuses and violations of consumers' consumers' privacy expectations. <coughs> what sets of remedies will make consumers whole in the event of privacy breach? And how to calibrate penalties and other possible legal causes of action without chilling industry incentives to innovate and grow their businesses? This legislation also addresses to what extent, if any, should the privacy framework set forth in my bill preempt state privacy laws and regulation? In holding this hearing, I would like to get a better handle on how extensively 
personal information gets shared without individuals understanding and without their consent. I also want to shine a spotlight on some of the actual harms that befall individual users through no fault of their own. With that said, I yield back the balance of my time, and now I recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee, Mr. Whitfield, for five minutes for the purposes of opening statement. Well, Chairman Rush, thank you very much, and uh, we certainly appreciate uh, our panel of expert witnesses uh, here today. Uh, as you know, we're having uh, this hearing to explore privacy legislation. I want to commend Chairman Rush for introducing his bill, and I want to thank him and his staff for uh, giving us an opportunity to review that legislation. And uh, all of us recognize that some steps need to be taken in this area, and we're hopeful that after today's hearing, uh, a lot of these issues will be clarified even more for us. Uh, because, as I said in the beginning, we look forward to your uh, testimony on this important issue. It seems to me the threshold question is whether Congress can require meaningful protections without forcing businesses online and offline to abandon or severely curtail legitimate business practices that benefit consumers. We know that it's easy to misuse information. And we also know that there are benefits from sharing information. So that balancing act is very important. The problem, I believe, for most consumers is the lack of understanding about how their information is collected and once used, how, and, and once they provide it, how that is being used uh, and, and the impact that it has on them. This is a preparatory hearing, and we always uh, have a lot of concerns about legislation, particularly uh, when it's in the area of privacy. Uh, one of the areas that I have some concern about is that the first party, third party distinction created by this bill could also give certain players in the Internet ecosystem a competitive advantage over others, and I think we need a level playing field. I think it would be very difficult also for Congress to be involved in every nuance of privacy. And uh, I, I think we need to be very careful about the latitude that we give the FTC uh, in this area. One of the areas that is vitally important, obviously, in, in policing any legislation is the enforcement mechanism. Uh, I'm always concerned about private rights of action because I know in some instances it has really created a cottage industry for uh, trial lawyers uh, seeking to manufacture privacy concerns. Uh, but I also know that sometimes uh, those appear to be, uh, the, these private rights of action seems to be uh, a, a good way to go. I do support the ability of state attorney generals to enforce the federal statute. Uh, I don't think this bill goes far enough in terms of preempting state laws, uh, creating the possibility that despite the bill's intent, covered entities would be subject to actions under multiple potentially conflicting laws or legal theories for conduct sanctioned by this bill. Whatever Congress ultimately enacts, consumers will not care really about the corporate structure or the regulatory regime that governs the entity collecting their information. They only want to be sure that their information is, is treated the same by all entities and that they have reasonable protection. And I feel quite confident that uh, when we uh, enact privacy legislation, uh, that we'll have a balanced bill that everyone will be satisfied with. Uh, maybe I shouldn't say everyone, but most people will be satisfied with. And uh, of course, that's our objective. And I yield back my balance my time. We'll, we'll be seeking everyone <laughs> on this bill. <laughs> uh, we'll now have uh, Ms. Casper for two minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman Rush, very much. And thank you to the witnesses for being here today. I'm looking forward to uh, your discussion of consumer privacy and the 
internet age and in such an exciting age of techno technological innovation. And I hope your comments will be directed to the two draft discussion bills that are on the table. We need your expert advice on how we balance the important competing interests of personal privacy and uh, business innovation. Uh, we do need to have rules in place that give consumers the option to share their information or keep it private. Uh, both bills before us require that companies explain to consumers what uh, information is being collected and gives them the ability to, to opt out of certain data collection practices. And I think this is what consumers are looking for. They want a simple explanation followed by a choice. Uh, but there are literally thousands, millions of new businesses that have been created as a result of the ability to share information. And I think this is uh, absolutely vital that we protect that interest as well. Nearly all Internet businesses rely on some form of information gathering. Uh, so we want to ensure that these businesses continue to grow and flourish, but in a way that protects, uh, that promotes transparency for the consumer. So thank you for being here, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you and Ranking Member Whitfield for having this hearing on the bills before us today, both focusing on consumer privacy. I'm pleased that we're once again examining this issue and that legislation has been brought forward with the goal of protecting consumers and their personal information. I look forward to hearing from our panelists and discussing the merits of these bills. As we take them into consideration and debate the best steps moving forward, I hope we proceed wisely and carefully. As I've stated at previous hearings, I hope we focus on how to protect consumers and their personal information and look at steps the industry will take on their own to do that. We need to make sure that these bills do not focus on ways government can get involved in more areas of people's lives where it does not belong. For this reason, I hope these bills take self-regulation into account and include provisions that allow companies to continue with steps they've already taken to protect personal information. If self-regulation is not sufficient and if any additional privacy provisions or regulatory requirements are needed, they should be targeted, consistent, and not discriminate against any one business or industry. Congress should not pick winners and losers. I also hope that these bills do not harm the ability of companies to maintain or invest in their businesses. We must strike a balance that protects personal information without limiting a company's ability to do business in an honest, honest and ethical way. Again, I look forward to hearing from our panelists on whether they feel these bills strike that important balance. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I also want to close by uh, addressing the rumors that FCC Chairman Janikowski may add broadband classification to the Commission's September 16th agenda. First of all, I do not believe that the FCC should reclassify broadband services or impose burdensome regulations on the Internet. And more importantly, the FCC should definitely not rush any process that gives Congress little time to react after returning from recess. Over 8,000 pages of comments have been submitted to the FCC on this proposal and the comment period is open until August 12th. For reclassification to be on the September 16th agenda, the other commissioners would have to receive the chairman's proposal by August 26th, giving the commissioners two weeks to review the thousands of comments. Clearly, we need to make sure that they have that ability to review those comments from the public. So I hope those rumors are in fact just rumors. Otherwise, it would seem the FCC intends on ignoring those 8,000 pages of comments as well as the bipartisan staff discussions that are ongoing on this issue. We must continue to pursue targeted legislation that serves the American people, not a hastened process that serves a political agenda. Thank you, and I yield back. The chair recognizes now the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Barrow, for two minutes. Uh, Mr. Green, uh, you're recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Thank you, Chairman Rush and Ranking Member Whitfield, and I want to thank you for raising the issue of consumer privacy and hold, for holding this hearing today. And also, Chairman Rush and Boucher, as well as Ranking Member Stearns, for uh, introducing the bills which we examine today. As technology continues to evolve, the privacy implications for consumers require frequent reexamination by Congress. In 2003, we passed the CAN SPAM Act that countered the alarming rise of unsolicited spam email messages that interfered with the use of Internet and email by end users. 
today technology has continued its progress and as a result we're once again confronted with challenges for protecting consumers and ensuring that private data is not shared without consent the ability to easily aggregate and share information over the internet is provided tremendous benefits to our society and our economy and the collection of consumer information can provide tremendous benefits to small and upstart businesses by allowing them to target customers that have tendencies to purchase individualized products or services <coughs> one problem however is that uh, these aren't the only w ones using the data and uh, the ability and type entities that uh, of uh, entities that s sell this information to, c to collect such a wide variety of information on individuals is extremely troubling because it allows bad actors to target vulnerable individuals based on very specific and, and granular data that has been collected across a number of online and offline platforms. We have laws that regulate how this information can be used by financial institutions in relating to medical record privacy, but outside these defined areas, the information is largely unregulated and has the potential for being tremendously harmful to consumers. I'm pleased that our committee is confronting these challenges head on. It's important that we examine methods to introduce transparency into the system and give consumers the ability to have control over the large scale data collection that is currently occurring and most times without their knowledge. And I look forward to hearing the testimony from our witnesses, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Um, Mr. Lala is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, meaningful legislation to protect consumers' data is important, as there have been recently uh, high-profile incidents involving the compromise of consumer data that has increased privacy concerns. There are many benefits that the Internet provides consumers, and it is important that consumers are protected. However, as with many of the public policy issues that this subcommittee considers, there needs to, balance, there needs to be a balance between protecting consumers and overburdening companies with regulation. The collection of consumer information is a great benefit to companies that process transactions as well as to market their products. In addition, many of these companies' products are based on information that consumers submit to then obtain information specific to them. This personal information must be protected, whether it regards personal health, employment, or any other information. While it is important for companies to disclose their privacy practices, companies should not have to disclose their proprietary practices or information for collecting this information. In moving forward on either of these pieces of legislation, we need a, to ensure that by expanding the authority of a government agency that there are no unintended consequences on e-commerce. I have heard concerns, especially from small businesses, about this legislation having a chilling effect on e-commerce and curbing innovation. These small businesses are concerned that increased regulations will have a negative effect on their businesses and have increased costs for them and those that are in self-employed ultimately, which will then have to be borne by the consumers. I look forward to working, continue to work on with the subcommittee on this important issue relating to cons uh, protecting consumers' privacy. In this time of rapidly advancing technology, we must protect personal information. I am hoping, hoping that this balance can be achieved for all the parties involved. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Mr. Stearns for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, like other members, I'm uh, very glad we're having a hearing on H.R. 5777, Best Practices Act, as well as the proposal drafted by Mr. Boucher, uh, the Chairman of the Communication Technology and the Internet Subcommittee, the CTI Subcommittee. Uh, I was a sponsor, a principal sponsor, with uh, Mr. Boucher on his bill. Uh, and so I'm happy to uh, join with him in soliciting comments, as he did uh, over the some 70 days. As many of you perhaps know that I've uh, had a lot of experience uh, working on this privacy issue. Uh, it's complex, uh, involves a broad range of interest. Uh, during my time as chairman of this uh, subcommittee, I introduced several privacy bills, so I understand the importance of transparency when it comes to collection, use, and sharing of consumer information. Uh, now, as my capacity as the um, CTI subcommittee, I've been focusing on privacy issues and the Internet, which has become so uh, ubiquitous in our everyday lives that we have started to presume, just presume a certain level of privacy that may not actually uh, exist. So that's why I think we should be looking at this uh, privacy situation. 
we must recognize that online advertising supports much of the commercial content, applications, and services that are available on the Internet today without charge. And my colleagues, we do not want to disrupt this well-established and successful business model. Now, this bill, Best Practices, seeks to enhance transparency over the commercial use of personal information and provides consumers with choices about the collection, use, and disclosure of this information. I support providing consumers with choices and transparency, but we must also keep in mind that only the consumer knows how he or she feels about the information that's being collected, the parties doing the collecting, and the purpose for which the information is ultimately collected. Congress cannot and should not make that decision for them. Now, I do have some concern with this Best Practices Act as currently drafted, including the overly expansive definition of covered information, the private right of action with uncapped punitive damages, and the safe harbor provision, which is too prescriptive and relies too heavily on the Federal Trade Commission. In order to have an effective safe harbor in privacy legislation, we must craft a provision that creates the right incentives for businesses to subscribe to the very best practices with respect to the use of personal information of those consumers. Standards that have been developed over time and are capable of being modified rapidly to address any new significant consumer pr privacy concern about businesses' use of con consumers' data. I'd like to work with my colleagues to develop a better self-regulatory structure that will protect consumers while creating the proper incentives for businesses to adopt and maintain the best privacy protection standards. Uh, I obviously appreciate having these hearings. Uh, I regret, though, Mr. Chairman, we're having a hearing only four days after the bill was publicly released. Uh, this is an important and complicated topic, and members and staff and our witnesses need more time to adequately analyze the provisions in this legislation. Uh, it's a credit to Mr. Boucher. Uh, he released his privacy discussion draft on May 4th, and he allowed ample time for comments. Now, if I recollect correctly, uh, there was 70 different organizations, uh, companies, universities, colleges, and concerned citizens that have taken the time to send their comments on this discussion draft. So we have a plenty of information to consider for his bill. So there's clearly a lot of interest out in privacy, out in the industry for privacy legislation. I feel that more time uh, allowed for more robust discussion is necessary, so I hope we have that in the future. But again, I appreciate your work and the leadership on this issue and also Mr. Boucher's hard work as I look forward to working with members of both subcommittees as we try to find the good, equal balance of protecting consumers and allowing in innovation to flourish. I'll just conclude to sort of mention what Mr. Scalise mentioned a little bit about the FCC and their haste to move um, the, um, from Title I to Title II uh, interdict Internet jurisdiction. And I would say that one thing I would add to his comment is when we get back in September, uh, it'll only be a couple of days perhaps until the FCC acts, and that's really not enough time for us to even consider what they're doing. So. Again, I urge, as Mr. Scalise did, that the FCC hold off. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, Mr. Chair, thanks uh, all of the uh, members for their opening statements. And Mr. Chair, I do want to uh, reassure uh, every member of this uh, subcommittee that uh, the, the time to necessary for deliberation will be forthcoming and that we this in no way do we expect to rush uh pardon the pun, to rush toward judgment. However, we do feel as though we need to start this process in a robust way, in a robust manner. And that's what was the intention of the chairman. Uh you know, discussions gotta end sometime and now is the time for the discussions and the work to begin. So uh, with that said, I want to welcome our witnesses now, uh, and uh, I am so honored that these individuals have taken the time out from their busy schedule to co come and share with this subcommittee uh, their uh, valuable information, uh, insight, and their expertise on this uh, most important matter that faces the American people. I uh, will introduce them now. From my left is Mr. David. Vladek, Vladek, rather, 
Vladek, 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 Vladek. Vladek. He's the director of the Bureau of Consumer Protection for the Federal Trade Commission. I see that next to uh, Mr. Vladek is Leslie, Ms. Leslie Harris. She is the president and CEO of the Center for Democracy and Technology. Uh, next to Ms. Harris is Mr. David Hoffman. He is the global privacy officer for the Intel Corporation. Seated next to Mr. Hoffman is Mr. Ed Merzeschi. Uh, He's the consumer program director for the U.S. Public Interest Research Group. Uh, and uh, next to Mr. Merzinski is Mr. Ira Rubenstein. He's the adjunct professor of law at the New York School of Law. And uh, next to Mr. Rubenstein is Mr. Jason Goldman. He's the counsel, technology, and e-commerce for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. And then we have uh, seated uh, next to Mr. Goldman is Mr. Mike uh, Zanis. And Mr. Zanis is the uh, Vice President of the Public Policy Interactive Advertising Bureau. Again, thank you all so very much for being present here at this hearing. And it's the practice of this subcommittee to swear in the witnesses. And I ask each of you, if you would stand and raise your right hand. We'll get there. We'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right. It's a, a big panel of witnesses we got here. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Please let the record reflect that the witnesses have all answered in the affirmative. And now we'll begin with testimony from our witnesses. We'll begin with Mr. Vladek. Uh, Mr. Vladek, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Chairman Rush, Member Winfield, uh, members of the committee. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Uh -huh. The Federal Trade Commission has a long track record of protecting consumer privacy. The commission began examining online privacy in the mid-1990s. Initially, the commission's work was built on the so-called fair information practice principles of notice, choice, access, and security. Uh, the Commission's efforts were widely credited with raising public awareness about privacy, prompting companies to post privacy policies online for the first time, and approving companies' accountability for privacy practices. In the early 2000s, the FTC shifted its focus and targeted harmful uses of information, uses presenting risks to physical security, economic injury, or causing unwarranted intrusions. This approach was designed to protect privacy without imposing costly notice and choice requirements for all uses of information. The Commission's privacy agenda included aggressive enforcement on data security, children's privacy, spam, spyware, and unwanted telephone calls, telemarketing robocalls. Last year, the Commission announced that it was going to again reevaluate its approach to privacy. We recognize that the traditional models governing consumer privacy have limitations. The Fair Information Practices model placed a heavy burden on consumers to read and understand complicated and lengthy privacy policies, policies and then make choices about the collection and use of their data. The harm based model generally did not address concerns about having one's personal information exposed where there is no direct and tangible consequence. Often, harms to uh, consumers were addressed after they occurred. Uh, late last year, the Commission began its reevaluation of privacy by holding three roundtables, which highlighted a number of important themes. First and most urgently, consumers do not understand the extent to which companies are collecting and using their personal data. This is a remark that I think many of the members echoed in their opening remarks. Second, existing privacy policies don't work as a means of communicating privacy practices to consumers and certainly will not work well on small screen mobile devices like smartphones. Third, consumers do care about privacy and they care about privacy 
as a value in and of itself beyond any tangible economic harm that may be associated with it. And finally, as others have pointed out, the free flow of information does help make tremendous benefits possible. So we need to be cautious about restricting information exchanges and uses. Recognizing many of these same issues, Chairman uh, Rush and Chairman Boucher each have proposed legislation to advance the goal of improving privacy protection in today's commercial marketplace. Uh, we share this goal and we applaud Chairman Rush and Chairman Boucher for their leadership. Although the Commission has not taken a position on the legislation, both proposals include a number of key policy objectives that the Commission supports. First, both include requirements for data security for customer information, a requirement the Commission has long endorsed. Second, the Commission supports the proposal's data accuracy requirements, especially where the data will be used for decisions about a consumer's eligibility for benefits or services. Third, both proposals give the FTC limited rulemaking authority in the privacy area. We believe that the content, timing, and scope of privacy disclosures required by the legislation will benefit from broad stakeholder input and consumer testing, which can be accomplished as part of an APA rulemaking proceeding. Finally, both proposals include innovations to simplify consumers' ability to exercise meaningful privacy choice. If Congress enacts legislation in this area, we urge it to consider some additional issues. Most importantly, we think it would be useful to require short disclosures at the point of inc information collective and or use and to give the FTC rulemaking authority so it can provide guidance on this requirement. Let me share an example of why we think short and concise notices at the right moment are important. A few months ago, it was reported that approximately 7,500 consumers had, quote, sold their souls, close quote, to an online computer game re retailer. To drive home the point that consumers don't read lengthy disclosures, the company included a provision in its privacy policy that by placing an order with the company, the consumer granted the company, and now I'm quoting, a non-transferable option to claim for now and forevermore your immortal soul. <laughs> the company even went on to provide an opt-out provision for this particular soul-settling clause. <laughs> but not surprisingly, very few consumers opted out. Now, I don't believe that these consumers really meant to transfer their right to their immortal soul to an online gaming company. And we think this this illustration drives home the need for short and concise notices that consumers will read and understand at the time of data collection and use. Another issue we would urge Congress to look at is whether the sharing of individuals' data among companies affiliated through common ownership should necessarily be exempt from consent requirements, especially where a company may share data with dozens or even hundreds of affiliate companies. Finally, we also have concerns that the safe harbor programs contained in the proposed legislation could lead to multiple consent mechanisms that may differ in important ways, which could add to consumer confusion when consumers need more simplicity. The Commission looks forward to working with Congress to resolve these issues and any others that may arise in order to accomplish our shared objective of improving consumer privacy while at the same time promoting innovation and beneficial flows of information on the Internet. Thank you very much. The Chair now recognizes Ms. Harris for five minutes. Chairman Rush, Ranking Member Whitfield, members of the subcommittee, uh, on behalf of CDT, I thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Chairman Rush, you, Chairman Boucher, Representative Stearns have shown great leadership in putting the issue of consumer privacy legislation back on the congressional agenda at a time where more and more personal information is collected, analyzed, and sold. An astonishing 88% of Americans are concerned about their online privacy. A consumer privacy law is long overdue. Drafting a privacy law that can stand the test of time requires a careful balancing of interests. The law must provide consumers' rights. 
It must provide meaningful obligations for companies, but at the same time, it has to be flexible and high level enough to respond to the rapid changes in technology and changing business models. It needs to give companies certainty while at the same time encouraging privacy innovation and accountable practices. And of course, it needs strong enforcement. CDT believes the bills before the subcommittee today include the essential building blocks for a privacy law that meets this test. Chairman Boucher's draft took critical first steps to that end. We believe the Best Practices Act builds on that draft to significantly advance the discussion. Uh, let me just mention a few key points. Fair information practices, commonly known as FIPS, must be the foundation of any consumer privacy law. Uh, the Boucher draft provides the basic obligations and no notice and choice and security, but as Mr. Vladek said, that places most of the burden on the consumer to figure out notices. Best practices goes further to a full set of substantive fair information practices that place obligations on companies for things like specifying purposes, limiting data collection to those purposes, minimizing how long one retains data, paying attention to data quality and integrity. And we think that in this complex environment, all of those obligations are critical. Uh, with respect to co scope, excuse me, CDT does support the application of a single baseline set of rules to the online and offline environment. We do support a robust definition of covered information and heightened protection for sensitive information. And we strongly support the special rules for covered entities, right now mainly ISPs, that collect all or substantially all uh, of an individual's data stream. We are pleased with the innovative provision on accountability in best practices, which requires companies to conduct PIAs, privacy impact assessments, and periodic reviews of privacy practices. Uh, American companies, including my colleague from Intel, HP, and Microsoft, have been the global leaders in developing an accountable privacy culture within companies, and we think this provision will broaden the culture of responsibility for all covered entities. We also strongly support the inclusion of a safe harbor provision. Uh, safe harbors, when they are backed up by rigorous internal compliance and some FTC supervision, can take account of differences between industries, uh, can create certainty for companies, it can encourage privacy innovation, and reward the adoption of accountable practices. Finally, strong enforcement must back up privacy rules, and we endorse the dual enforcement regime at the FTC and with the State Attorneys General. And we also applaud the inclusion of a strong private right of action in the Best Practices Bill. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to testify in holding this important hearing. We intend to submit a lengthy side-by-side -side of the bills and our recommendations for moving forward. And we look forward to working with you to enact uh, historic privacy legislation that consumers are strongly demanding and that we believe businesses need to compete in the global economy. The chair recognizes Mr. Hoffman for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Whitfield, and members of the subcommittee, I'm David Hoffman, Director of Security Policy and Global Privacy Officer at Intel Corporation, and I appreciate the opportunity to testify before you today. Intel supports the Best Practices Act of 2010, and we believe that innovation requires a policy environment in which individuals feel confident that their privacy interests are protected. We thank Chairman Boucher and Ranking Member Stearns for putting forward such a thoughtful and important draft from which to work. Their bill and the Best Practices Act include many of the important concepts for a comprehensive U.S. privacy law, and we strongly support Congress's efforts to legislate in this area. I congratulate you on the work you have done to protect consumer privacy and to promote continued technology innovation. It is Intel's mission to deliver the platform and technology advancements that have become essential to the way we work and live. We see computing moving in a direction where an individual's applications and data will move as that person moves through his or her day. To manage these applications and data, the individual will use a wide assortment of digital devices, including servers, laptop computers, smartphones, tablets, televisions, and handheld PCs. Thus, it is necessary that individuals have trust in being able to create, process, and share all types of data, including data that may be quite sensi sensitive, such as health and financial information. 
The provisions in the bills we are discussing today can help provide a policy environment which creates that trust. I would like to highlight five specific aspects of the two bills. First, we are pleased that both bills are technology neutral and give flexibility to the FTC to adapt the bill's principles to changes in the technology. Maintaining technology neutrality in the legal framework provides protection for individuals in a rapidly evolving society, as the creation of legislative and regulatory requirements will invariably trail innovation of new technology. We specifically like the Best Practices Act's guidance given for the FTC to create regulations for certain key provisions of the bill. Second, we support federal legislation based upon the fair information practices as articulated in the 1980 OECD privacy guidelines. We are pleased that the Boucher Stearns discussion draft is based upon the framework of the fair information practices. Further, we are supportive of Chairman Rush's bill, which goes further and includes provisions applying all of the fair information practices, such as individual access to data, data minimization, and purpose specification. Third, we are pleased that the Best Practices Act includes a provision requiring covered entities to engage in accountability processes in the deployment of technologies and services. In addition, we would advocate that a specific privacy by design requirement also be included in the accountability section. A privacy by design model focuses on ensuring that privacy is included as a foundational component of the product and service development process. Such a provision should not require compliance with detailed standards or mandatory third-party product reviews, but should instead focus on including privacy into a business's product and service development processes. Fourth, Intel commends both bills for contemplating that certain operational uses of data are implicitly consented to by individuals and should not require explicit notice and consent. Specifically, Intel supports the Best Practices Act's drafting of such a use-based model. Fifth and finally, Intel is strongly supportive of Title IV of the Best Practices Act, which establishes a safe harbor for participation in self-regulatory choice programs. Intel has long been a supporter of privacy trust mark programs and believes they provide a way to work with organizations on their accountability processes. We believe that in many instances, trust marks and other similar mechanisms can substantially increase the reach and the effectiveness of government enforcement. This co-regulation is a better solution than a private right of action, which is likely to result in baseless claims causing organizations to expend resources on litigation when those resources could be better directed toward the organization's privacy compliance program. However, if a private right of action is included, then the choice program should continue to provide a safe harbor from liability. Intel again thanks Chairman Rush and the subcommittee for your excellent work to protect consumer privacy and to promote continued technology innovation. We are supportive of the Best Practices Act. We look forward to continuing our engagement to improve the overall protection of privacy. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Mirzinski, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chairman Rush and uh, Ranking Member. Uh, I was trying to work my timer. This one's not working, but I'll try to stick to five minutes. Uh, uh, Ranking Member Whitfield, members of the committee, I am Ed Merzwinski. I'm Consumer Program Director for the Public Interest Research Group, U.S. PERG. My testimony as submitted includes co-signed uh, uh, co by the Consumer Federation of America and the Center for Digital Democracy since then. Uh, four other organizations, and I'll provide this for the record, Consumer Action, the Consumer Watchdog, Privacy Rights Clearinghouse, and the World Privacy Forum have also endorsed the testimony. Um, I, I want to start out with one point that is the, really the main point that I want to make, and that is that the current digital marketing system does not meet consumers' expectations of privacy. A recent study by two leading universities, University of Pennsylvania and University of California at Berkeley, found that most consumers believe that the government already protects their privacy. It does not. Instead, we have a digital marketing system, uh, marketing system that I call, uh, could call uh, the Hoover model, and I'm not talking about J. Edgar, I'm talking about the vacuum cleaner. Uh, the vacuum cleaner model of collecting every bit of information, every web track that a consumer ever makes, and keeping it forever is the way that companies like uh, in their virtually unregulated digital ecosystem. You know, we have a system right now where the Federal Trade Commission uh, has been hobbled for 30 or 40 years by limits on its ability uh, to improve the rules 
uh, that and enforce the rules uh, by the Magnuson Moss rulemaking that was imposed on it that this committee tried to fix in the um, in the Wall Street Reform Act, but uh, unfortunately the Wall Street Reform Act did not finally uh, give the Federal Trade Commission full APA rulemaking authority or full aiding and abetting liability or the full ability to impose civil penalties. And we would hope that that would be on the committee's agenda to continue to try to achieve those goals. But so our organizations share longstanding concerns for consumer privacy and look forward to working with the committee on these matters. And um, the committee has had a long-standing history of a uh, bipartisan basis working on consumer privacy, so we're very encouraged uh, by the work that was done first by Chairman uh, Boucher and Ranking Member Stearns and then by you, Chairman Rush, in putting together your thoughtful proposals. Uh, however, our concern is that the proposals uh, tend to graft fair information practices on top of the digital ecosystem uh, that it, it just won't work as well as a full fair information practices based provision might work. So we're suggesting uh, that the committee start over and um, among the key elements of a revised bill would be a framework focused on overall data minimization. Anyone who knows the online and offline data collection industry will tell you that the focus is on data maximization, as I said, the Hoover model. Every move you make, as the lyrics of the police song go, could be the data collection industry's theme song, as we are all being watched, compiled, analyzed, and then acted upon. While tools involving opt-in and safe harbors, for example, provide greater control by a consumer, they do not constrain the dramatic and far-reaching growth of online and offline data collection for personalized and innovative targeting. Uh, a vast automated and powerful data collection complex has emerged capable of generating and continually revising a profile, a consumer x-ray of our habits, interests, worries, financial status, uh, and everything else about us. It is now being uh, collected not just on the internet, but also whenever we use a cell phone or play an online game uh, or use any other variety of electronic uh, gimmickry uh, that we might be carrying around with us. Uh, some of the specific concerns that we have, again, we think the bills are a thoughtful first start, but we would, we would urge you to consider a few other things. First of all, notice and choice are not enough, and I totally agree with the other witnesses that these bills go further than the industry preferred FIPS light of notice and choice. Uh, but we need to have a greater reliance on uh, limiting the amount of information that is collected, used, and shared, increasing the knowledge of consumers, uh, limiting data retention uh, and maximizing data minimization. Uh, the second, self-regulation has not worked. Uh, the Federal Trade Commission under various administrations uh, has failed uh, in self-regulation as has the industry. And uh, uh, there are several reports that I cite in my testimony that go through the details of how first the individual references uh, services group self-regulatory body uh, that, that supposedly regulated information brokers uh, didn't work in the 1990s. Then we have the network advertising initiative didn't work. And uh, there is an uh, IAB provision that was started last year that we don't think has worked. So we think we need greater oversight, greater uh, statutory protections. And we need a broader private right of action. Although the Rush bill has a narrow private right of action, uh, we don't think private rights of action enrich trial lawyers. We think private rights of action deter lawlessness, and they encourage companies to comply with the law. Uh, and second, we believe that state laws should always be allowed to be stronger than federal law. If you've got a good enough federal law, the states will move on and do other things. But if Congress doesn't solve the job, we need the states as uh, quick responders to new problems. Uh, uh, with that, I'll just conclude my, my comments and tell you that I'm very pleased uh, for our organizations want to continue to work with you to refine and enhance this legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Rubenstein, you're uh, recognized for five minutes. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Whitfield, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Ira Rubenstein, and I'm an adjunct professor at NYU School of Law. This afternoon, I will focus my comments specifically on a key question in congressional efforts to regulate privacy. What is the relationship between privacy legislation and industry self-regulation and the role and effectiveness of safe harbor provisions 
and promoting self-regulation. A safe harbor is a familiar legislative device intended to shield or reward firms if they engage in desirable behavior as defined by statute. In the privacy arena, the most familiar example is the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. Over the past decade, COPPA safe harbor programs have met with success mainly in terms of complementing FTC's own enforcement efforts. But the program has two main shortcomings, weak incentives and a low rate of participation. Only about 100 firms have joined. In my written testimony, I propose several ways in which Congress might improve upon the COPPA safe harbor by adopting a more co-regulatory approach in which industry enjoys greater scope in shaping self-regulatory guidelines while government sets default requirements and retains general oversight authority to improve, approve and enforce such guidelines. A co-regulatory approach relies on both sticks and carrots as incentives. Sticks for non-participating firms might include a private right of action, broader opt-in requirements, external and independent audits of regulatory compliance, and much stricter requirements for online behavioral advertising. Carrots, on the other hand, might include not only exemptions from private actions for safe harbor participants, but also cost savings, such as compliance reviews based on self-assessments rather than external audits, government recognition of better performing firms, and regulatory flexibility in the form of tailored requirements addressed to specific sectors or business models. In proposing this new approach to privacy safe harbors, it bears emphasizing that safe harbor benefits should be limited to firms demonstrating superior performance and would not be available to other firms that merely satisfy default statutory requirements. In other words, a safe harbor would only benefit firms that meet high performance standards based on, for example, sound data governance practices, such as appointing a chief privacy officer who is accountable for setting privacy protection policy and standards, advanced privacy methodologies, such as the use of development guidelines for building privacy protection into products or services, also called privacy by design, as Mr. Hoffman mentioned, and other best practices, such as privacy training for relevant staff and online guidance on privacy and security issues for other employees and for consumers. In closing, I want to emphasize that this new approach to privacy safe harbor should not be confused with existing self-regulatory schemes in which industry alone develops and then oversees the privacy code of conduct. Rather, in a privacy safe harbor as envisioned here, the government sets default requirements and relevant standards and practices emerge from a multi-stakeholder process in which both advocacy groups and members of the public have an opportunity to participate. This requires that interested parties engage in difficult and perhaps protracted negotiations and keep talking with each other until they forge a rough consensus. One way to ensure public participation is negotiated rulemaking, a statutorily defined process by which agencies formally negotiate rules with regulated industries and other stakeholders as an alternative to conventional rulemaking. An alternative approach would be to modify the safe harbor approval process by requiring that program sponsors engage in a public consultation and report on these consultations in their applications. I will conclude by offering three recommendations which I'm happy to elaborate upon during this hearing. First, Congress needs to enact comprehensive privacy legislation incorporating robust fair information practices. Second, this legislation should include a safe harbor program based on a co-regulatory approach as described above. Finally, this safe harbor program should include strong performance standards based on data governance, advanced privacy methodologies, and other best practices. And it should also require public consultation as part of the safe harbor approval process. The two bills being considered today represent important first steps in developing this new approach to safe harbors, but should be expanded as discussed above. I want to thank you again for this opportunity to testify. I will be pleased to answer your questions and would be happy to provide any further assistance. Mr. Zanis, uh, Zanis, you are recognized for five minutes. You want to happy to oh, do I'm it. I'm sorry. That's all right. We don't want to uh, skip over uh, Jason. Mr. Goldman, I'm sorry. Mr. Goldman, thanks very much. Recognized for five minutes. Um, good afternoon, uh, Chairman Rush, Ranking mm -hmm. Member Whitfield, and members of the subcommittee. I am Jason Goldman, Telecommunications and E-Commerce Council at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce is the world's largest business, business federation representing the interests of more than three million businesses and organizations of every size, sector, and region. On behalf of the Chamber and its members, I thank the subcommittee for its work on consumer protection and for the opportunity to testify here today. 
Uh, privacy is a key issue for the Chamber. Uh, the Chamber supports policies that foster business opportunities while respecting consumers' privacy. The collection of personal information is necessary to provide consumer, social, and business benefits. Given the diversity of private sector, uh, given the diversity of the private sector, business should have latitude within acceptable guidelines in defining what they need, uh, what kind of information they need to collect and use. Recently, the debate over privacy has been brought to the forefront by the growth of the internet. The internet has revolutionized the way business is conducted in all sectors of the global economy, including financial services, retail, wholesale distribution, and manufacturing. Today, the vast majority of companies, small and large, um, are online and use, the and use the internet to communicate uh, with consumers and with uh, the vendors and, and uh, different other entities. In particular, um, ad-supported content has been key to the success of broadband. Frequently, online content is provided free of charge to consumers, and revenues are instead generated through advertising. This ad-supported business model has been a key to the success of many internet ventures and has helped to make the internet an engine of growth in the U.S. economy. I will now turn to the bills that are the topic of this hearing. The Chamber received the text of the Best, Pre Best Practices Act just a few days ago, so my comments today are based on our initial read of the bill and may change as we further analyze the bill and vet the bill through our membership. Uh, the Chamber's anal uh, analysis of the Boucher Stearns discussion draft was submitted to their subcommittee in June and is attached to our testimony. Uh, the Chamber very much appreciates the work that went into drafting the Best Practices Act. Uh, despite the inclusion of some provisions that we support, we still have strong concerns with the bill as currently drafted. Uh, the Chamber, I'll go through some of the, uh, uh, some of the provisions that we support and also some of the ones that we have um, modifications to. Uh, the Chamber is pleased that the bill directs the FTC to promulgate rules under this act in a technology neutral manner. Government should not pick winners and losers. The Chamber applauds the inclusion of language that would preempt state laws governing the collection of the and the use of data. However, the uh, Chamber believes this language could have been even stronger to help businesses avoid having to comply with 50 different state laws. The Chamber agrees with the intent of Section 502, which states that the bill should have no effect on activities covered by other federal privacy laws. However, the opening clause of this section states, except as uh, as uh, provide expressly in this act. This could be interpreted by the FTC or by the courts as permitting the creation of multiple layers of regulation. Uh, the Chamber appreciates that the bill attempts to maximize regulatory flexibility. However, at the same time, the Chamber is concerned that the sheer number of rulemakings will create needless regulatory uncertainty. Uh, the Chamber also believes that the safe har harbor provision as drafted is a good start, uh, but improvements could be made. We are gratified by the recognition that industry self-regulation in this area has and will continue to protect consumers. However, the safe harbor, in our opinion, is too narrow and should follow um, the FTC and industry principles. And, 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 and the also, the Chamber has serious concerns about uh, private right of action, as well as an explicit grant of authority to state attorneys general to enforce the legislation. When combined with the FTC's own enthor enforcement authority, we are concerned that these additional mechanisms will serve to impose duplicative and potentially inconsistent findings of liability as well as excessive damage awards. In addition, the explicit grant of authority for the award of punitive damages and attorney's fees will serve to increase the likelihood that elements of the plaintiff's class action trial bar will use this legislation as a way to increase class action litigation with little benefit uh, being given to the general public. The Chamber also has some concerns uh, covered in more detail in our testimony uh, with the opt-in requirements for third-party sharing and opt-out requirements for information collection as these provisions could upset established business practices uh, for many of our members. Uh, finally, the Chamber has concerns with access and dispute resolution and the definition of covered information which I'll be happy to discuss uh, further during our Q&A. Uh, thank you again and I'm happy to answer your questions following Mr. Zan. Now, Mr. Zanis, please, uh, for five minutes now. Thank, Thank you. you. I, I, I used to work for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, but I don't think they would appreciate me delivering their uh, testimony here today. 
Thank you, uh, Chairman Rush, Ranking Member Whitfield, members of the subcommittee for holding this hearing for the opportunity to testify about these important legislative proposals. My name is Mike Zanis, and I do work for the Interactive Advertising Bureau as Vice President of Public Policy. The IAB represents some 460 companies involved in online advertising. Our companies run the gamut from the largest portals and search engines to branded publishers that includes ad networks, all the way down to the smallest mom and pop shop publisher online. The common theme for all of these folks is that they depend upon online advertising. It's a good industry and we're continue to grow even in these tough economic times. In the first quarter of this year, online advertising revenue in the U.S. grew to $6 billion. Uh, and uh, that represents a 7.5% increase over the first quarter of 2009. More importantly, our industry is a major component of the national economy. We add more than $300 billion to the U.S. economy and provide more than 3.1 million jobs total. But we know it's not all about economic numbers here today. We know in our industry that the number one asset that any company has is the consumer relationship and building trust through protecting their privacy and meeting their privacy expectations. That's why our industry has a long, successful history of strong self-regulation. It began over a decade ago with input from the Federal Trade Commission when industry stood up the Network Advertising Initiative. And this was a, uh, a program to oversee third-party ad networks and how they collected and used data for consumers and provided choice. But we knew over time as our industry grew and innovated, then so too did our self-regulatory programs. They needed to innovate and grow and expand. That's why over two years ago, IAB joined with the Association of National Advertisers, the American Association of Advertising Agencies, the Direct Marketing Association, and in conjunction with the Council of Better Business Bureaus, one of the most respected, reputable, self-regulatory monitoring and compliance programs in the world to create, for the first time, a broad, comprehensive set of online privacy practices for advertising purposes. Here, too, we took away lessons from the Federal Trade Commission. They issued their, their staff report about online behavioral advertising privacy principles in February of 2009. We incorporated many of those principles in our draft or excuse me, in our final principles that were issued in July of last year, including transparency, consumer notice, and something that we haven't talked about, which is consumer education, which is really a key component here. All of this leads me to the bills and the pro legislative proposals that are on the table today. And Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for your recognition in H.R. 5777 about the importance of industry self-regulation. We, we think that that's the right approach in that it has a long history of success, it can be more flexible and dynamic, and there's a commitment by industry and government agencies to make sure that it works. And we stand ready to work with you to make sure that any legislation that moves forward reflects upon and bolsters the success that not only the FTC has pushed out there and achieved, but that industry and our cross-industry self-regulatory group we're beginning to see fundamental change online already in this marketplace about how consumers receive information about uh, how data is collected and used and pushing choice out ubiquitously. That leads me to my second uh, point, then we are very gratified to see your recognition in the bill that a one-size-fits-all consumer notice jammed down in a privacy policy, then often is written in legalese, may not serve consumers all that well. In fact, in our industry, we're seeing a tremendous amount of innovation in w better ways to serve notice to consumers. And we hope to preserve that type of flexibility in, with any legislation that moves. But, and there's always a but, we do have a number of reservations about H.R. 5777 and Congressman Boucher's proposal. And they share a couple of components, and I'd like to just identify here. The first is the concept that first-party data usage requires an opt-out. Here we simply have to agree with the Federal Trade Commission's finding in their staff report. When consumers go to an online website, they understand there's going to be a certain amount of data exchanged by that first-party site then, then to serve them content and services and, yes, advertising. And so we, we think that they should be first-party, clearly first-party usage 
should be exempted out of this choice mechanism, not notice. We should always do better around giving consumers notice about how the data is collected and used. The second issue I'd like to raise with you is the third party data sharing provision. The internet is nothing but a series of third party relationships. Virtually every website requires these third party data sharing, whether it's to customize content, to run your analytics on the backside to make sure you know who's coming to your site and who and getting paid, or whether it's for relevant advertising. And so here again, we agree with the FTC's principle in their staff report that you should have an opt-out requirement, empowering consumers to exercise their choice when they have legitimate concerns around privacy. You need to give them good notice, you need to empower them, and you need to educate them, which is something that the IAB is committed to. So I'll just sort of leave you with this last thought, and I look forward to your questions. I think it's impossible to take information out of the information age. Because if you do that, what you're going to get is less relevant advertising. And less relevant av advertising, by definition, is spam. I don't think anybody wants that. That's not good for consumers, and it's not good for business. Thank you. The Chair, I want to thank all the witnesses for your uh, outstanding testimony uh, today. Uh, a vote now occurs on the floor of the House of Representatives. There are two votes. It uh, should be probably about 30 minutes or more, around 30 minutes. So it's the chair's intention to recess the subcommittee and to reconvene immediately after the uh, last vote uh, takes place. And so it'll be a, about a half an hour. So uh, I apologize for the interruption of this hearing, but we will be back as soon as we can. Then subcommittee now stands in recess.